So let's move on to metastatic disease. Um, Dean, your approach for systemic he chemotherapy for a patient with metastatic bladder cancer. Does the site of disease make a difference? Uh, is there any optimal approach that you have in that situation? So I think it's, it's a, a classic case of one size does not fit all patients. And I think, I think all of us recognize that uh, there's variability in, in patient tolerance for therapy. What we do know is that cisplatin-based chemotherapy can be curative in a subset of patients, but still curative. And, uh, and that should be our, what I think, our optimal approach. And whether it's GEMSYS or whether it's MVAC, et cetera, is not as important as that it's cisplatin-based chemotherapy. That having been said, it means uh, identifying uh, with reasonable clarity the patient who is likely to be able to, to tolerate six cycles of chemotherapy, which is the standard of care. So we run through a list of, of uh, criteria for cisplatin eligibility, and that includes examining for renal function you know, using the various methodologies. We use the CP, C, uh, CKD EPI uh, formula for, for us in clinics. Some people will use you know, collect creatinine clearances, et cetera. Um, we look at auditory acuity uh, and, uh, and cardiac function, et cetera. And if the, if the patient is cisplatin eligible, um, then we will proceed with cisplatin-based therapy. And it, it varies from either GEMSYS or MVAC. It can be either one uh, within the institution. We and others have, have looked at a number of different prognostic scores. Uh, one that we've used is a very simplistic one. Patients who are treated with cisplatin-based therapy, if we look at five-year survival as an endpoint, the patients who do best are the patients who have nodal-only metastatic disease, uh, and, and that is, you know, that um, there's no visceral uh, sites of, of disease, and, and then secondarily is that they're unencumbered from their disease, which means that they have a good performance status. And in our hands, patients who met those criteria, uh, that actually had a 24% uh, five-year survival. That's been examined in the, in the uh, metastatic disease randomized trials, where you know, patients who have uh, one is in the MVAC versus GC trial, uh, that there were long-term survivors, even with um, visceral disease, but those who had nodal-only disease um, had a higher rate of, of uh, survival. So that is for the patients who meet uh, cisplatin uh, eligibility. For patients who don't, uh, it could be for a various number of reasons. Most of the time it's for renal function, but it can be cardiac and the other, other uh, uh, reasons. Um, and most of the time that's a carboplatin-based regimen for us. We tend to use carboplatin plus gemcitabine based on the DeSantis study, the ERTC randomized trial, well tolerated. I think the survival, as we look at it, the survival are less in terms of median survival and long-term survival are less with carboplatin-based therapy. Uh, but I think that's the de facto standard of care. Some patients uh, can't even tolerate carboplatin. Again, this is an older patient population. Multiple comorbidities tends to be a smoking-related disease. Uh, and so some patients are treated with single-agent uh, therapy. For us, it might be gemcitabine or taxane, for example, if they have very poor renal function. Uh, and uh, and our, our goals in that setting are really palliation to try to reduce the, uh, you know, the, the side effects of their disease uh, in the first place. Those are areas I think are really ripe for exploitation in terms of some of our newer drugs. In, in the original MVAC series, there were some patients who were rendered complete response with surgical resection. Uh, after six cycles, do you ever consider surgical resection uh, for residual disease? Well, almost routinely, um, but, uh, but you have to be highly selective of those patients who will benefit from post-chemotherapy consolidation surgery. So we and others have, have, have published that uh, one is you, 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 know, you can't change the biology of the disease. Meaning that uh, you need a good response in terms of, of cytoreduction, um, you know, uh, in terms of benefit. And then secondarily is that you really want to operate on one site of disease. Uh, and so, uh, it, optimally one site of disease. So, and we've taken that, like some people would say to extremes, I've had patients, for example, with supracavicular disease, mediastinal residual disease as a sole site. Many of us will, um, won't think twice about if it's residual disease in the, in the bladder that will do a cystectomy on pelvic lymph node dissection if it's local uh, regional uh, metastatic disease. I have several patients who had a solitary bone met in, in rib who had residual disease, removed the rib, and a long-term disease-free survival patient. So uh, the only place we haven't seen it is the liver. But I think uh, if we closely examine the data, patients who have a partial response and are selected for post-chemotherapy surgery, um, that of those who have residual disease, one-third of them, in, in our series, were still alive and disease-free at five years. So that's an excellent outcome. And then the second thing is that the survival of those patients who are PR, but 
were then converted to CR by surgery had the same long-term survival and survival distributions as the patients who were CR from chemotherapy alone. So I think it's a good take-home point. It's been seen in other diseases. We're doing other diseases, and I think, you know, it's a good point here. I mean, certainly my, my longest survivor in that situation is somewhere around 16 years, uh, and he had a sigmoid colon metastasis, uh, and he's still chugging along, so he's done very, very well. Um, Evan, um, in cisplatinum ineligible patients, what do you like to do? Well, I take a very similar approach to Dr. Bajoran. I first look at whether they can receive gemcitabine carboplatin. As you said, the long-term outcomes, the response rates are a little bit less than with gemcitabine cisplatin, but that would be my first step. If uh, they really can't receive that, once in a while I've used gemcitabine taxol, although that has some toxicities as well. There is some small phase two data that shows uh, around 40% response rates in that setting. But uh, if you have to go to single agent, you certainly can use gemcitabine and the response rate's pretty close to 30% with single agent gemcitabine in that setting as well. So I certainly have used single agent gemcitabine for patients that I feel like are just poor performance status or renal dysfunction. Uh, but that being said and done, um, <clears throat> I feel like that it's very rare that I encounter a patient that just can't be treated at all. It's, you know, it does happen occasionally. But usually, you know, that would, that's the approach that I would take with somebody who's platinum ineligible. You, usually they have so many, the, the patients who can't be treated have so many comorbidities that it's just not possible to even get, th think about putting a dose in and you would wind up uh, either putting this patient in the hospital with neutropenia or, or other reasons that their functional reserve is usually very poor and that's, that's the type of patient that you would see in that situation. So after